Every voice telling me that I'm thinking wrong. Change your tune, change your chord, sing that other song. Never believed I could be right or be me. What is me? They just tell me what I'm supposed to be. Gotta be a brand, but I never really owned it for myself. Now I'm nebulous, I'm tired of it, distressed my mental health. See my chaos and I know I gotta speak into it. I see my apathy, I know I gotta battle ruthless. I know my father look at me and he is well pleased. The problem is that I ain't good enough for me. And I get down I must struggle till the day is done So guys, uh, welcome back to the commission. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Bryce Newberger. I'm the youth director here. Um, we're starting up our new February series um, called Purple Heart. Um, the idea behind it is uh, it's a, it's a four-week series. It just kind of covers every week in February. I'm really excited about this series. I've been spending a lot of time and energy and prayer uh, on, on these things. Um, will you sit in your chair? I would, call, I would call a bouncer. And it's a bouncy ball. Um, but uh, anyways, guys, uh, <clears throat> so the idea is, uh, you know, February is a time where, you know, it's Valentine's Day and, and, you know, whether you're in a relationship or don't want to be in a relationship or don't care about relationships, the point is you can't really avoid like the, the ooey gooey, you know, time of, of year that this is, uh, you know, boyfriends and girlfriends and, and they're like Hollywood puts out like romance movies around this time and they're like, go on a date, you know, that kind of stuff. So uh, regardless, culture has a lot to say when it comes to the matters of the heart. And it really boils down, in my opinion, to just some simple colors, uh, you know, pink is one of them blue is the other and purple uh, kind of sums up all the rest but the idea is like uh, it has a lot to say on uh what women are what women should be who women are what women should do our culture has a lot to say on what a man is what a man should be what a man should do um and then we deal with questions like uh well what if you're not pink what if you're not blue what if you're purple what what about even making purple if you know what that is um the point is is that there's a lot that our culture has to say about these things and so this series, we're just going to go through and we really want to take a look into what our culture says and what the Bible says and understand what's the truth. What, what can we understand? So real quick, let's pray. <clears throat> let's jump on into this thing. So thank you, God, for tonight. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us here. Thank you, God, for February. You know, thank you, Lord, just for this time that uh, we can love one another, Lord, and uh, focus on relationships. God, that doesn't have to be romantic, you know. February, I'm planning on just showing my kids how much I love them. Uh, you know, we can show our parents how much we love them, our brothers and sisters and just friends. You know, it's a, it's a good time to just kind of give people you care about like a little, a little like gram that says like, hey, you matter. Um, so thank you, God, for this time of year. Um, and uh, Lord, just uh, speak to us uh, through your word and uh, let us know what, what your message is, God, what you have to say about these things. In Jesus' name, everyone said? Amen. So guys, um, for those of you uh, who know a little bit about me is I have a technical background. Um, and so like my brother, uh, my whole family is just really into tech. But my, my brother, he develops apps for a living, my brother Brian. And it was a long road to get there. But either way, um, when he's developing apps, he develops apps for all sorts of stuff. And so what you have when you design an application, something that you download on your phone, you download on your computer, now you even download them on your Xbox, wherever the case is, someone will come and say, hey, I want this app to be designed. And so what they'll do is they'll talk to the guy and they will draw up what's called the design document. So they'll take the design document and the leader of the tech team will go and he'll present the design document to his team. Now this document, it's gonna explain what the app was created for and what the app does, right? So the idea is like, let's say, let's say this, the world just like had an apocalypse and like apps become sentient, you know? And an app is like, where am I? Has anyone heard of the movie Nine? It's like an old movie with Elijah Wood. Yeah, right, yeah. This guy like makes these puppets and then like these like mechanical, like little weird looking kind of creepy puppets and then he dies. And then like they wake up and that was like the last human. And they're like, they don't know why they're there. Like they don't know who really created them or what they're supposed to do. It's a really weird situation. But yeah, let's say an app did that. Um, a design document would be so important to them. If they, if they found like, if they're like, who am I? Why do I sound like Elijah Wood? You know, and they're going, they're like, oh, like here's a manual. And they can just open up this manual and it tells them literally like, hi, I made you for this purpose. Here's what you do. You know, like that would be pretty important to these things, right? 
So the idea is that we have a design document. We, we were given by our creator um, a, a little document that tells us how we were created and what we were created for. So what I want to do is I want to jump on into that design document and see what it has to say. What is my purpose? You pass butter. Yeah, welcome to the club, pal. So sad. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 1, uh, verses uh, 26 to 31. So you're in your Bible, uh, just in case you don't know how to get there, it goes Genesis. And then you're there. So um, if you want to pick up a Bible in the chair, it's Genesis chapter 1. Uh, it goes Genesis, then it goes verse 1. And then you're there. So... Um, Go ahead and skip on down to verse 26. So let's go ahead and read this. 1, 26. Goes 1. So anyways, um, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that moved along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw that he had uh, what he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. So as we go through this, there's some very obvious things that stick out. One important thing I'd like to point out is that God says he created them in his image. Male and female, he created him. So right there, there's a very important thing. God created, when it says mankind, it means humankind. Because it's not just men. It says he created men and women in his image. Okay? So that's really important. Now, uh, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to get more specifically into God's design for men and God's design for women. And how we are both created in his image. But for now, let's just go ahead and move on and just understand that God created men and women in his image. Okay? So, this phrase, the image of God, in God's image, it is known as the Imago Dei. That's what the words translate to. It means the image of God, the Imago Dei. So, the Imago Dei is what we're going to focus on for this sermon, okay? So one thing I really want you guys to, to really get kind of clear right now before we go any further, all right? Um, this is not a sermon about homosexuality, about transgender, about who's a sinner, who, sh who we should condemn. This is merely an observation into what the Bible says about our design, what God in intended upon our design. So this, this, this sermon is merely to look at what happens when we fulfill that design and what happens when we break that design. So naturally, we're going to have to touch a few areas here, but the main idea is just that the, the point of the sermon is not to actually get up and, and I'm not here today to talk about like homosexuality. I'm not here today to talk about gender confusion, that kind of thing. We're merely going to focus on what God's design is, what the image of God is and what that means for us. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, take a look back at this. So the, the one word that really is just all over the low passage we read is rule and dominion. It's just nonstop. I rule the earth, subdue the earth. I give these things to you. Dominate. Like there's, there's just dominate, 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 dominion, rule, subdue, all this kind of thing. Now, the misconception here is that uh, a lot of times is that dominance and, and being a ruler, that that's kind of a male thing. That's not true. God said he created man and women in his image. And when he spoke, he spoke to both of them. He said, this is your purpose subdue, dominate, rule, okay? Now, there's a brokenness in the design, which we'll get to when we talk about men, and how men have, uh, masculine, masculinity has more of a habit of like taking dominance in the wrong direction. But the point is, is that it's not just a masculine thing. Women are rulers too. We are all put here to rule. So, as image bearers of God, we possess an innate and inborn quality of God. That means something very significant. Um, so, uh, just from this verse alone, 
the command is God created us in his image. And then he tells all of us specifically, I've given you dominion. I've given you the, the right to rule the earth. The earth is yours. Okay. So there's other things about the image of God that are so intrinsic. In fact, um, the rest of the Old Testament and the rest of the New Testament draws all of their teaching about relationships and about love and about the image of God is all drawn from these chapters in Genesis. Okay. So dominion is the first thing that we see, but also from being image bearers of God, Genesis nine, six goes on to talk about the image of God. It says, whoever sheds man's blood by man's blood, by man, his blood shall be shed for in the image of God, he made man. So real quick, well, uh, what is this? Just later on, it's like this thing. It's just uh, an extrapolation. It's God just expounding upon the image he created us in. He says, Hey, the image of God, that's what I, that's what I, I've created you in my image. Okay. So when someone kills someone, when someone attacks someone, when someone goes after someone, God says, when you're attacking that person, you're attacking me. You're attacking my image that I, that I've created on this person. So there's a special protection there. He says, yeah, if you shed man's blood by man's blood, you shall, your, your blood shall be shed. So he's put up protection over us. He said, this is my creation. It's different than a deer. It's different than a dog. It's different than, than a plant. Okay. It's different than a fly and an insect. Okay. Human beings are created in the image of God. So he puts a special protection around us and says, there will be trouble if you attack my image. If you mistreat my image, which keep in mind is all of us as humans, we have a inborn protection that God has given us. Okay. So more than that, Ephesians 4, 24 goes on and it says that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Okay. So it says that we were created in the image of God. What happened here is that yes, we were created in the image of God, but something went terribly, terribly wrong, right? We had sin. So Adam, Eve, they got a bad deal on produce. Um, and some, some things went horrible. Okay. Um, what ended up happening is that, uh, we lost part of the image of God. Um, so it says, put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So in our, in our very being, when we were created before God, we were created righteous. What righteous means is righteous means to be right, to be, to be just, to be, there was God. He saw us. He walked with us in the garden. There was nothing between us. Okay. It's like when I have a great relationship with my wife, all right, it's like, everything's right in the world. You know, I can like sit with her on the couch and put my arm around her and there's nothing wrong with it. As opposed to like, when there's an argument, I'm like, hi, I'm sorry. Okay. So like the idea is like with God, like we were right. And then we lost that righteousness. So what happened is because that is innate to our creation, because that is so much part of us, God took special care of us. He sent his son, Jesus to die on the cross, raise again, and he restored that righteousness. Okay. Not the point of the sermon, but a little side note is now we're only complete in the image of God when we have Jesus, because it restores the righteousness. But either way, that one was for free. So the idea is that, um, that we, we had this righteousness as part of our creation. We were created right before God. And it says, it says, put on a new man. It means the new man is the term there. It's talking about being saved. Okay. It's talking about accepting Jesus. It says, now you were created according to God in God's image in true righteousness. And the second part is really important here. It's holiness. Now holiness, what this means is it needs to be set apart. Okay. We have a lot of like misconceptions about the word holy, um, especially when we go around saying, holy cow. But the point is, is that holiness is something that's set apart. Okay. If I have a collection, which I'm a nerd, so I collect a lot of weird things. Okay. So if I have like a collection, I don't just like collect things. I'm like, ah, just throw it on the floor, like next to my other stuff. No, like when I'm collecting something, when I have a collection, I've got like a display case and I'm like, you go here. Okay. It's like a special like love that I have for a little plastic toy, but either way. So God created us holy. He, he created us and he set us apart. All right. So he says that I want you to be in the world. We're in this world, but not of the world. Okay. Uh, later on scripture says, do not be conformed to the image of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. All that being said, it's just very important to remember that God created us righteous and he restored that righteousness through Jesus. And he created us holy. We were special. We were set apart. Um, when you really understand what holiness is, that, that special protection, that special care, 
And when that really sinks in with you, it really tells you how much God loves you, how much he cherishes you. Just like I would take like a little plastic thing and put it on a shelf. God takes care of you and he says, this is mine. This is my own. This is my creation. Like, I love, I love this. Okay. So he created us holy. The last part, and really when it comes to the image of God, like, like there could be like eight different college semesters on the image of God. If, if I'm, you know, not getting ahead of myself. We're just going to hit four points today that I believe encompass kind of the good general idea of the image of God. So the last one is James 3, 8 through 10 says, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings. We have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. So what he's saying there is that because we're image bearers, okay, there's a term for you, because we bear the image of God, um, he says that there is, there is something special there. Just like before with the protection, when you guys curse, when you gossip, when you cuss out, when you talk bad about, when you slander, all these kind of things, when we do that to someone, God says, it's my image that you're talking about. It's my image that you're defiling, that you're defaming, that you're, that you're slandering, that you're cursing. It's my image. And then James goes on to, to point out to us, he goes, by the way, guys, when we do these things, not only are we cursing God's image by cursing people, even your worst enemy, even the person who you think deserves it the most, bears the image of God, was created with the Imago Dei. It's someone that deserves special protection, holiness, and righteousness. So not only that, but when we go after these people, when we say these things, we also defile the image of God by doing that because God's not like that. So when we start acting in a manner that God would not act, we as image bearers of God drag down the image of God into the mud. We, so he says, guys, listen, we were created in the image of God. Why are we talking like this? Why are we doing these things? Don't you understand how special that person is? Don't you understand how special you are? You're worth so much more. They're worth so much more. Brothers and sisters, this should not be. Do not defile the image of God by doing such things. This is what he's pointing out. So really interesting. Go ahead and leave that up for me. We have dominion. We have protection. We have a righteousness and holiness, and we have an inborn honor. Okay. Uh, and I don't think I, I spelled that out enough, but that whole point is that we have honor. God honors us and we're to honor others because God is to be honored. That's the whole point as image bearers of God, how we would treat God. Now, not worship and like paying sacrifices to, but, but the care and the love that we would show towards God, towards Jesus himself, is the type of the care and the love that God would ask us to show our neighbors, to show everyone that we come into contact with. Okay, so we have an inborn special honor. So let me kind of like boil this down for you guys, all right, with a little, with a little story that is back in my childhood, all right, um, accompany me in the way back. But uh, what's going on here is like when I was 10 years old, yeah, when I was 10 years old, my brother Brent, he was my oldest brother. I had a middle brother, Brian. I was the youngest. I was the baby of the family. But my, my oldest brother, Brent, he was about 17 years old. Anyone 17 in here? Yeah, there you go. You can raise your hands. It's awesome. Okay. So um, he was 17 years old. He was working at a place called Shalotsky's Deli. Has anyone ever heard of that? Yeah. Okay. They're around. They're like lesser known Subway and even lesser known Quiznos. But uh, <clears throat> anyways, he was working at this place called Shalotsky's Deli. He was 17 years old. Um, and, uh, and he takes like, you know, does anyone even have a job, right? Like anyone? Yeah, there you go. Like you don't make much money on your first job when you're like 17. When I was 17 and I got a job, I got $75 like every two weeks. They're like, thanks. Here's your check. I'm like, thank you. Um, but my brother took you know, 17 years old. He took his money. He went down to Walmart and he bought for me and my middle brother, Brian. I was 10. Brian was 11 and Brent bought us mongoose bikes from Walmart. Um, like 12 speed, like, <clears throat> and he brought it to us and he's like, because you're my brothers and I love you, which like I reached out to him and I was like, Brent, it really struck me like how unique it is for a brother to do that for his little brothers. So I was like, I just want to let you know, I love you. Mwah. But either way, <clears throat> so, uh, Brent, Brent bought me this bike and I love this bike. And so there I am riding my little bike down the, uh, down the, uh, the neighborhood as one does and out of the ditch. Like, you know, like in Oklahoma is where I was. And there, there's like these ditches that go down. I think you guys have those here too. Uh, this bully comes out in front of me and grabs the handles of my bike. And my back tire like flies up and then like goes back down. And I'm like 10 years old. I'm like, stop it. You know? <clears throat> and, uh, 
And he's like, and I could see he like locked eyes with me and he had this kind of sadistic glee, you know, like when someone bullies and he's like, <laughs> and he starts grinding the gears of my bike, which on a bike, you don't do that. Right. And the first thing my brother told me was, Hey, like, make sure you're pedaling when you and work your way up in gears so you don't break the chain. So I'm like, stop it. Like my brother Brent gave me this bike. <clears throat> and actually, no, I had just said my brother. I said, my brother gave me this bike. And, uh, you know, and he said that'll break it. And he like looks up, he's like, eh, and he's like gonna make fun of me. And then he locks eyes with me and he starts to recognize, not me, but he starts to recognize my family resemblance. And he goes, and he lets go and he goes, you have a brother? And I was like, yeah, Brent. So the thing about my brother Brent, is he had kind of a reputation. Uh, he was in high school at the time. He wasn't a well-adjusted teenager. Um, he had, and I'm not condoning this, but these are the facts. He had a reputation that when someone, and people usually ask for it, they pick on him. But when people would go after him, um, he wouldn't just like defend himself. He wouldn't just like punch a guy and like throw him down. He would break bones. Like he like would break fingers. Like he like would actually leave like deformities on people by like tearing the skin. Like he, and people knew like, you don't mess with Brent. When you mess with Brent, like, you limp away if you're lucky, you know, like he's just a person you don't mess with. And so instantly he looks at me and it connects. He sees the family resemblance. And I go, yeah, my brother, Brent, he goes, Brent, Brent, Brent Newberger. And I was like, yeah, he's my brother. And he's like, and he literally said out loud, like when I read comics, cause I love comics, they only have so many panels to like tell you what's happening. So villains always like say way too much. You know what I mean? They're like, oh no, I dropped my freeze ray, you know, or whatever. This guy goes, he says out loud, I'll never forget it. He goes, everyone knows you do not mess with Brent Newberger. And he goes, I'm sorry. I was, I was just joking. And like, I could see like, as he's looking at me, he's terrified. He is terrified. And I have become the object of his terror. Not because I'm so strong, not because like I could beat him up. I was 10, he was 15, right? But he was terrified because I bore the image of my family. I bore the image of my brother. And, and as he recognized me, he literally ran. Like he jumped a fence and just kept running. Like, and I, I'll never forget that moment. But if like little 10 year old Bryce with like even little like 17 year old Brent and little 15 year old bully, um, as much as, as I had this like special protection because Brent was my brother, as much as I had this special honor because Brent was my brother, how much more do we have special honor? Do we have special protection? Do we have a special dignity and honor because we bear the image of God? Our heavenly father created us in his image. He put his very image on us. He didn't have to do that. He could have created like a little alien creature. He could have created like another monkey. He could have created a fish. Like he could have done whatever he wanted. Like this is the race I'm going to go with, you know, but instead he chose to take his very image and put it upon us. We are wonderful. We are unfathomable. The Bible says that in Ecclesiastes 3.11, he has made everything beautiful in its time. He has uh, also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. What it's explaining is that when it comes to us, when it comes to how we're made, I want to add one more. Psalm 139.14 says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that well. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. There is an awe to the way we were designed. There is a mastery to the way we were, we were created. I was watching a, I was watching a, a, like a Buzzfeed video and these guys are doing like watches and they showed on the back of the watch, it had like a little clear window so they could see the inner workings. And the guy who got the watch is like, man, I just love this. He goes, no one will ever see it. It's on my wrist. He goes, but I just like to flip it over and look at how amazing this watch is and just see all the clockwork going. But here's the thing, anyone can make a clock. You might be like, well, I can't. Well, yeah, but if you spent 10 years and like had a manual and someone taught you, you'd crank out watches like none other. Anyone can make a watch. But the idea is that when God created us, he put in us an awe and a wonder. It goes on. We can't even imagine. It says we're almost, it, we're fearfully made. We're wonderfully made, which means like when we consider the complexity of the design that God has put in us, it should scare us. It is so wonderful. I think about uh, last year, it's too many stories, but uh, I, last year we went to uh, Disneyland, Disney World, I apologize. And uh, Amber, 
it was her first time to go. I grew up in Florida, so like a little bit, and so I would go a lot. So I knew Disney, Disney World. Amber was her first time. My parents flew us down to Florida, like we went. And afterwards, Amber was like, man, I thought it was a theme park. She's like, which it is, but like, it's not. There's so much more. It's so, it's, it's really magical. Like that's just, like, she was like blown away by Disney World. And as cool as like Walt Disney is, as great as, as his like land of wonder and adventure is, it's nothing compared to us. It's nothing compared to the way that we were designed. But what happens when we break that image? What happens when we break that design? What happens when we have our design document, right? We, God's like, here's how I created you. Here's what you were created for. I mean, it's not even like your job is to pass the butter. You know, it's like, what, what's my purpose? You pass butter for a living. Oh, no. Like, no. Like, God's like, here's your purpose, and your purpose is to rule. Here's your purpose, and I've given you special protection. Here's your purpose, and you have honor and righteousness and holiness. I've created you fearfully and wonderfully, and I've even left a book behind for you to read to tell you how amazing you are, to tell you how beautiful you are, to tell you how awesome you are. But what happens when we say, thanks, but no thanks? What happens when we break that image? What happens when we're like, listen, I'd rather find my own purpose. I'd rather follow my own design. Let's take a look at some people finding their own design. Hands, they are amazing. They can open doors, seal business deals, and convey raw emotion. But oh. we're not gonna use them today! That's right, today is all about the feet. What we're gonna do is pretty simple. We're gonna take a lot of things that people normally do with their hands and we're gonna see how well we can do them with our feet. It's a game that we like to call, Can Our Leg Hands Do What Our Arm Hands Can Do Good To? Oh. Let's see. Do I wanna write with my right foot or my left foot? Oh my gosh, this is gonna be very difficult. <laughs> now as silly as that is um you know we're not really going to talk about you know yeah i shirk the image of god i'm gonna just walk on my hands for a living no like okay we're, we're in a little deeper than that um and some of like here's what i found about teenagers especially um they like you guys love to be like well actually bryce i heard of a woman who was born without hands and she takes care of her kids and she drives and she's just fine without hands. Okay, well here's the deal. Yeah, like she had a special car designed for her. Yes, she lives in a special house that she can't really live in a normal house like a regular person. And if you ask this person, are you happy without hands? She's like, well, I'm happy, but arms and hands would be really good. Like she won't tell you like, oh, I'm s like, no, like hands, pff, you guys don't know what you're missing out on. No, like even she, someone who is making do with the best that they can, like, she doesn't want to live that way. She, she does, she's not like, she wouldn't have chosen that, all right? None of us here, and if you really believe it, none of us here are like, I'm gonna go to doctors and just be like, please take the arms, you know? Like, that's not, that's not gonna happen. So, what I really wanna do is I wanna get into what happens when we break the image of God. What happens when we shirk God's design? What happens when God says, this is what you were made for, and you say, nah, I'm gonna do something else. Romans, and buckle in here, because this is, the, the word of God here, all right? Um, just watch the eyebrows from being singed. Uh, Romans 6, 9 through 11 says, <clears throat> Because of this, God gave them over to their shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with one another, with other men, and received in themselves due penalty for their error. So what it's explaining is that God handed them over to their sin, okay? We've all, most of us have struggled with addiction. Most of us have seen friends struggle with addiction. It's out there. We've even seen addicts on the side of the road. It, I mean, if we're all being honest, I'm sure we've all dealt with it to some way. Even my son Liam struggles. He's like, daddy, I gotta play Pokemon. Okay, but the point is, is that when we abandon the image of God, God says, fine, okay, you don't, you don't want my image. I will hand you over to what you love so much. And it says that he hands us over to whatever we want. And, and no longer do we rule, no longer do we have dominion, we're enslaved. 
Okay, when you talk to your friends who struggle with addiction, when you yourself struggle with addiction, when you see people who struggle with addiction, they're not free. They're slaves. That's not a life people would choose, right? Like, <clears throat> that's, not, that's not ruling like God intended for us. We're not ruling over the world. The world is ruling us. More than that, <clears throat> it says that they defile with shameful acts. So now, not only are they throwing out the, the ruling, okay, so you don't want God's design for ruling. You're going to follow your own thing, and it's going to rule you. Have fun. Next is shame, because now we have this special honor that God gave us. Like, I designed you beautifully and wonderfully. There is honor for you. And when you say, I don't want the image of God, you abandon your God-given inborn honor, and you defile it says people defile themselves. They do things that other people would think are unthinkable. And guys, please note, when I say defile, I'm pulling punches, all right? Like, I don't have a rating approval here to go into what shirking the image of God, the health problems with that, all right? And just a little time on Google will just ruin your day. But <clears throat> we would just squirm and it would mortify us. But for the sake of keeping things semi-light, I'm just going to say defile for tonight. And we can, we can get into that some other time. But we give up our ability to rule. We give up our honor. And instead, we're enslaved to our addictions. And we do things that we would, one, at one time, we would have considered unthinkable. It just becomes a regular, everyday thing. There's a story in the back of my head of a dear friend. And I can't, I can't tell it tonight. It's too... It's too deep. It's too dark. But oh man! Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> moving on, First Corinthians six nine through eleven says, "Or do you not know that the wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, no, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor sl uh, swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were, but you were washed." You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. As I explained before, guys, we were born righteous. We were given this righteousness and we lost it. Like, you know, again, Adam and Eve, bad deal on produce, whole sin, shebang. Jesus came down so that we could have life and life more abundant. He came down so we could be saved, so we could be sanctified, so we could once again have that righteousness. But for those of us who say, I don't want the righteousness. I don't, I don't want to be right before God. When we shirk the image of God, and that image says that I've created you righteous, and we say, we don't want it, okay, then you're, then you're not righteous. What is it? You're guilty. Okay? It's not, God's not like, well, guilty. No, like, you are guilty, and you have a get out of jail free card, and you just, no, I'm good. So, we abandon our righteousness. We abandon our holiness. No longer are we in the world, but not of the world. We become of the world. We, became, we become part of the world. In fact, it's hard to tell the difference between the world and us. And so what happens is when we abandon the image of God, we embrace the world. We forsake that righteousness. And because of that, we're punished. So no longer do we have honor, but we are guilty. We are worldly. We are punished by our own choice. Because God created us. He says, this is, this is what I have for you. It's our own choice that we say, listen, I know I was created in this way. I know I was created for this purpose, but I'm going to willingly ignore that purpose. I'm going to willingly ignore that design. Fine. God's not going to force you. He's not like, no, 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 you conform. No. He loves you too much to force you. He loves you too much to, to hold your hand with a firm grip and say, I don't care what you want. I'm going to make you do what's right. No, he loves us too much. So he says, okay, you can have the other thing. It's a beautiful gift. It was his very self, not just through his son, Jesus, that he gave us who died and rose again on our behalf, but he gave us his very self in that when he created us, he put himself in us. He put his very image on us. God is something better for us, but we choose the world time and again. Can we get real for a second? Scripture is great, but let's be honest. There's people out there who are like, this is the image of God. And they're like, cool. I don't believe that. They're like, well, okay, but hold on. There's like, I can show you how prophetically, mathematically, cosmolog cosmologically, uh, prophetically, th this all makes sense. Like I could, I could, yeah, but I don't care. I don't want religion. I don't want your God. I, I'm good. Like, I don't want to hear it. 
Okay, so let's get real. How do we talk to those people? Let's just break it down to then the, the facts that they love so much. I love facts too, but um, <clears throat> the leading result of adolescent suicide and suicide attempts, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, is transgender and homosexual identification. This was a study that was completed as of 2018, okay? Um, a lot of pastors make a mistake where they like, quote facts and you're like, oh, this is from 2005. Um, this is a study completed as of 2018. Why not 2019? Because we in it, okay? So like we just completed 2018. They compiled the data. They pushed out the report. They said the leading cause, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, is transgender and homosexual identification. 2018. Suicide has climbed exponentially. In the last 20 years, it just keeps getting higher and higher. 129 suicides are successful every day, and this doesn't count the attempts. These are only the successful ones. 129 a day. And so when the day is done, when the sun sets, 129 people will have ended their lives. The leading cause is homosexual and transgender identification. What does this tell us? Well, a lot of people like to say, it's because we're not accepting, right? Like, oh, it's, it's you Christians and you, you know, you, you conservatives and you people keeping them down. And because you do that, like, they can't deal with life. So we need to accept them more. So they, you know, just, just lay on the love. Tell them it's okay. Don't, don't ever, like, try to speak into someone and, and tell them that they're wrong. Um, interesting. Because now we have TVs. Like, we have TV shows. We have movies. We have music. Um, we've been putting out songs for so long telling everyone, no, no, like this is cool. Like we accept, like it's all good. For so long that we should have seen a difference by now. But you know what's interesting? Every year it only gets higher, but they have more acceptance than ever. Now we have, now we have movies, TV, media, TV, like uh, celebrities are coming out. We have parades that take over cities. We have celebrations. We have churches that are known as affirming churches. Like, no, come here. It's okay. We have parents that now are like, yeah, no, like my kid, like I'm just whatever they want. Like we'll pay for surgery. Like we're just going to support them in this. Okay. We are accepting now more than we ever have. And more people now are having higher depression and higher suicide attempts and higher suicide accomplishments than we have ever had in the history of the world. I, I don't, I don't understand that. Because the more we accept, the more we say it's okay, the more that we try to like not speak any truth to them, the more unhappy they are, the more unhappy we are as a nation, the more unhappy society gets. It's interesting too with this because what happens is there's a big movement now for like women's rights and for, and for, and yes, God created women to rule. I'm going to talk a lot about that coming in the next few weeks. It's going to be fantastic how beautiful you are, how wonderful you are, all the things God has created us for. But we've taken away women's ability to be strong. We've taken away women's ability to be determined and to be driven because if a woman comes up and she says, I'm determined, I'm driven, I'm strong, we say, you must be gay because that's kind of a man thing. That's a masculine thing. So... Um, Women then, according, if we follow this mindset, if we follow this philosophy, then there are no strong women. There are just gender confused people who should be men. I think, I think women are better than that. I think women are strong. I think women are determined. I think women are capable of many things and great adventures. But the world as it is calls it love to say, no, 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 no. Like you're not actually a girl. That's for boys. Men, at the same time, they lose their right to be sensitive. They lose their right to, to be emotional, to lean on one, to, to lean on one another. They, they lose their ability to be vulnerable. And if a boy comes up and he's like, ah, you know, like if he's got a lot of emotional intelligence, if he's really keen on, on, on feelings and emotions, which is something that is a God-given thing to him, that he should lean into that. God has created that person to reach out and touch people and to actually care for their lives. They say, ah, must be gay. Must be, must be a girl because those are feminine things. So men no longer have the right to be emotional. Men no longer have the right to, to lean in to one another and to, and to be supportive and to be nurturing. And we wonder why we see so many problems with dads as time goes on. And, and men are having such a hard time just putting their arms around their kids and saying, I love you so much. You mean the world to me, buddy. 
Because we've said, no, 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 you can't do that and be a man. And that's what our culture is telling us. It, 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 it becomes twisted. We have stories in the Bible of, of such relationships that are amazing, like David and Jonathan. David and Jonathan is a story that I love so much. I told it at my wedding. I, I had my best man there. It's a story of David had this relationship with Jonathan, the son of, of Saul. And they had such a close relationship that they, they cried with one another. They suffered with one another. And when the time came, Jonathan, who was the rightful king, he gave his sword to David. And he gave everything he had to David. He said, take this. It's yours. I recognize your right. And they, they loved one another. And my brother calls me up once. He's like, hey, Bryce. He knows I'm in seminary. I'm like, yeah. He goes, was David gay? I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, no, I'm just talking to some guys here. And they're telling me that, you know, David had this relationship with Jonathan that was just a, a homosexual relationship. And I'm like, no, just because he had a good relationship with a guy. And I, I think of my, so I, I told the story to my best man at my wedding and I gave him a sword with my family crest on it. And I told him that I loved him because we had been through it together. We had been through some things. We cried together. We bled together. I remember times where he showed up at my house and he's like, he just didn't have words and he just collapsed. And I just put my arm around him and I loved him. That's what men do. We support one another. But instead they say, no, when you see a relationship like that, it must be homosexual. It must be inappropriate. David and Jonathan must have had some sort of sexual attraction for one another because men can't do that. We're robbed of genuine friendship. Of genuine relationship. The same story is out there for Ruth and Naomi. Ruth was this woman who had a husband. And he was, he was a Jew and she was from Moabite. And she didn't have the God of the Jews. And when she saw the God of the Jews, she, she fell in love with God. And what happened is her husband died. And she just clung to Naomi, at her, her mother-in-law. And she said, where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. I'm going to follow you. And her mother said, no, no, no. Like, this is not good for you. Go back to your own people. She says, no, no matter what comes, I'm going to stick with you. And these two women had one of the most beautiful relationships in all of the Bible that two women have had, where they just leaned on, they supported, Ruth sacrificed, the, the Naomi sacrificed. They both gave up things for each other. And it's out there now that people are saying, ah, no, like women can't have relationships like that and be genuine. It, she must have been homosexual. This must have been some sort of, you know romantic relationship they've taken away good true friendship good true fellowship that god has given us he put these things in the bible to say look this is a relationship this is a friendship this is how we build one another up and the world just twists it the culture twists it and says look 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 at this thing and they defile it so guys when it comes to these things can we take a moment out of our busy schedules, out of the rat race of, of who likes me, who accepts me? Is it okay? Are people going to call me a hater? Are people going to call me a bigot? Are people going to think I'm cool? Can we just take a moment out of our busy schedules and actually look at the people who are hurting? Actually look at the confusion in our society? I was listening to a podcast this morning of, of a guy who, who's from a liberal station, but I really just, I like to, I don't sit in my own world. Like, what do Christians say? No, I really love to get the other perspective. And as I'm listening to this, he invites this 19-year-old boy on who identifies as asexual. And he says, like, hey, like, and the kid's like, yeah, I thought people should know about this. He's like, cool. What do you know about this? He's like, I don't know much. But he invited him to be, like, the spokesperson. Like, why are we taking this kid who is dealing with confusion, who is dealing, he admittedly doesn't know things. And we're like, and his response to be loving, to be accepting was like, oh, man, yeah. It sounds like you really don't know what you're talking about. He's like, yeah, no, I don't. He's like, that's cool. That's cool. You know, I just want to support you, though. So you keep figuring that out. You know, instead of actually providing him some help, instead of actually turning to what even science says, even to, to turn into DNA and genetics, instead of even turning to those things, it's just like, good luck. Right? And so what we do is we shift awkwardly. No, no, no. It's worse than that. We don't just shift awkwardly and say nothing. Some of us go so far as to pat him on the back and say, good job. Keep going. And then we turn the lights out on our way off. Just leaving him in darkness. Good luck figuring that out. We don't give them the truth that we have. I remember one of our old youth students, she, she was one of Amber's girls, Amber had these girls that she just loved. We'd call her in the middle of the night. You'd hear me talk about them a lot because they were always there. Um, and you'd hear me talk about my guys a lot because they were always there. Um, and uh, good girl, loved God, loved Jesus, had some problems, you know, who doesn't? And when she graduated, Amber had made for her this paper mache heart 
just like had all these like pictures of them together and she wanted to give it to her but she couldn't get a hold of her she's like where you know where hello like where'd you go not answering the calls she was dodging her and was like what's going on so amber just hey i've got this birthday gift for you i love you i just you know it's all of our fun times together i just love it i just want to give it to you and she ghosted her she wouldn't talk to her and so amber couldn't couldn't even find her later on on her instagram story it comes out that she identifies as bi and so what happens is you know amber is like oh well this is sad this is sad. Why? Because we have the truth. We know where this leads. We know the lifestyle she's buying into, and we know she knows better. We know she sees the image of God. And so what happens is, when it comes to this part, um, Amber can't get a hold of her. She's trying to reach out. So Amber calls in one of the other youth girls, sits down with her, and says, Hey, um, are you, do you have contact with her? I just, I just want to know what's going on. Like, have you heard? And her response was, Yeah. Good for her. What? Yeah, good for her. What do you mean? Well, as long as she's happy, that's all that matters. As long as she's seeking her own happiness, that's all that matters. Well, here's the problem. Because as she continued to lean into this culture, to lean into this identity, and then it was wild parties, and it was raves, and it was drugs, and you can see on her Instagram feed how things just keep getting more and more revealing, more and more promiscuous, and you can just see her body, she's just sinking away. Her eyes just become dark. Her, 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 she's become so thin. She's wasting away. She looks sick. She's got marks on her. Does she look happy? Is she happy? Yeah, we say good for her. Go be happy. You do you. No advice. The only advice is keep going the way you're going. I'm sure it'll be okay. 129 people a day. 129 people a day. The leading cause of suicide and suicide attempts is gender confusion. And yet in our culture, we love so much to say nothing. We love so much to, to when we do say something, we support. We love. And we don't even send a get, we don't even send a get well soon card. Guys, the send home is this. This is very obvious, okay? When we conform to God's image, we're fulfilled. We have dominion and protection and righteousness and holiness and an honor in our God-given nature. God has created us fearfully and wonderfully. And when we conform to that image, we're fulfilled. Life is good. That doesn't mean you don't go through hardship. That doesn't mean that bad stuff doesn't happen. It doesn't mean that it's all daisies and roses and sunshine. No. Sometimes life just sucks. Let's be honest. Okay. We have some days. But I can tell you what. My good days when I conform. Or my bad days when I conform to my image of God are more fulfilling and more alive than my bad days when I'm running from it. When we embrace the image of God. When we embrace our design. How God created us. When we act in accordance with our design document. We're fulfilled. So in closing, in the next few weeks, we're going to take a look into what the image of God looks like in men and women. All right. <clears throat> so my encouragement to you guys is next week, we're going to talk about the boys. All right. We're going to talk about the blue side of the purple heart. Um, girls, don't check out. They're like, ah, it's boy time. I'm going to go get my nails done or something. That's a thing, right? Um, no, please come. Please see what a real man looks like. Right? Because... When the time comes, you guys might not be seeking. That's, that's cool. It's probably encouraged, actually. But um, when, the time, when the time comes, you want to know what a real man looks like, right? And more than that, you have men in your lives, whether it be uh, brothers or fathers or just other boys around in this very room uh, that you can encourage, that you can uplift. So we want to see what God's image says about men. So one, when the future comes and you're actually looking, you can know what a real man looks like and not be fooled. And second... Um, you can also learn how to encourage the men in your life. You can actually learn how to build them up, how to support them, how to respect them. Okay, uh, guys, same thing. The week after that, we're talking about the pink side of the purple heart, all right? So don't check out. Don't be like, ah, it's girl time. I'm going to stay home and play a video game. I got better video games anyways. But the point is, is that, um, I'm sorry, okay. But uh, the point is, is that come, actually, like, we want to learn how to respect, how to actually love in the way God intends to love women, how he's created them. Okay, and then also, shoe goes on the other foot too. When the time comes, you want to learn the difference between a girl who will ensnare and destroy versus a girl who will lift up and build. 
Okay, so um, it's very important that we check into these things, guys. So please keep coming. Um, and guys, just a little uh, final disclaimer. The goal of today, like I said before, we just wanted to focus on the image of God. Okay, we just wanted to focus on the design God had given us. All right, so my intention was not to gay bash, was not to tell you who to hate, who to condemn, who, who to, you know, go after, who you can run like, sinner, 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 got him. No, the point is, is that, because let's be honest, they would go like this, sinner, 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 got him, okay? We're all sinners. We all have sin, we all struggle. The point is, guys, the point of today was just to look at God's image, God's design that we have, to see what happens when we follow it, and to see what happens when we break it. We merely wanted to use it like a roadmap and look down the road, Okay? And you can't hide where a map goes, all right? It goes somewhere. And so we looked at God's image. When we follow it, it goes a very obvious place. When we don't follow God's image, it goes a very obvious place. So if you guys are looking for ways to actually talk to your friends who are struggling with this, if you yourself are struggling with this, um, or, or if you just have people in your lives, you're around it. Guys, let's be honest. We're in this world. Okay, it's Vegas. All right, but regardless, it's the world. So... If you guys are looking for ways like talking points, how to be better equipped or, or just have questions yourself, please come to small groups. Please, please check it out, okay? Small groups this week, we're going we're gonna to dive in a little deeper. We're going to actually take a look into how to deal with these things more practically, okay? So um, we'd love to equip you with some talking points and just, just some good uh, realm of thought in God's word and scripture. So uh, let's pray. Thank you, God, for tonight. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us today about your image. Um, God, we don't want opinion, Lord. Um, we just want to know what your word says. So, Lord, encourage us to take all the scriptures we've heard today and not just sit on them, that cool, good story, but to actually meditate on those things, to actually chew on them, to, to go home, open up our Bibles, and actually read, God. Challenge us to actually take your word and put it to light, to put it to action, God. Uh, don't just let us just sit back lazy and be like, yeah, what you got? Okay. Thank you. See you next week. Thank you, Lord, for leaving us challenged and inspired. In Jesus name. Amen.